Welcome, welcome to To The Point. Very exciting uh, program today. Today and the next program, we're going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin. And I'm going to invite you to make up your own mind. I'm going to ask you to please uh, not listen to what everybody else says, because virtually everybody on the planet thinks the Shroud of Turin is a fraud. I'm going to tell you in about three minutes' time why it couldn't possibly be a fraud. I want you to look at the first photograph. Um, that is a picture you've probably seen. It's the photo positive image of the actual image on the shroud. I'll explain that in a moment. If that is the face of, of Jesus Christ, then the next picture, image number one, is the face of Jesus. So what we're going to be doing now is describing what happened after the uh, crucifixion, how Jesus was met. Uh, buried, in what sort of burial clothes he was buried, according to the actual uh, words in the scriptures. And we're going to talk about um, radiocarbon dating. And I'm not saying that the radiocarbon dating is wrong. I actually think it is perfectly correct. It shows that the, ra the Shroud of Turin is very radioactive. I think it's simply being misinterpreted by the scientists who did it. It is very radioactive because it's been through the resurrection. Now, I personally believe the Shroud of Turin, without a doubt, scientifically proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, I want you to make up your own mind, uh, but please keep an open mind on this subject. So we're going to quickly move through this. Um, it is quite a, a, a long subject, uh, which is why it takes two, two programs to explain it to all. The uh, next picture is image number two. Uh, Jesus appeared to Mary after the resurrection. You remember Mary didn't immediately recognize Jesus Christ. And I think it's the same with the Shroud of Turin. People don't instantly recognize Jesus Christ. In fact, I think the Shroud of Turin is a parable. Uh, I think the Shroud of Turin is a parable, a scientific parable, which actually only genuine uh, believers in the Bible will ever understand. Because most people see the Shroud of Turin, um, they look, but they don't really see, and they hear about it, but they don't understand. So I want you to look and see and understand about the Shroud of Turin. I hope you find that exciting. I want you to play Sherlock Holmes with me. All right, let's move on now. The next picture, image number three, is what the Shroud of Turin actually looks like. Um, it's a piece of ancient linen. Um, it's actually um, 14 foot 3 inches long and 3 foot 7 inches wide. It is currently kept in, uh, in Italy in Turin Cathedral. But it's only been there for the last 400 years. So if it is the throughout of Jesus Christ, it's only been there for 20% of its lifetime. Um, it it um, actually has the photo negative image of a scourged and crucified man. And what we're going to try and do is to try and work out how that image got there and who that could be. Now, the next image, number four, is to explain to you what photo negative and photo positive is, because a lot of people now use digital cameras and don't really understand um, about photo positive and photo negative. On the right, we have an ordinary picture of Robert Louis Stevenson. On the left, we have a photo negative image of him. And you'll notice that all the black has be now become white and all the white has now become black. That is what photo positive and photo negative means. In the old days, we had cameras. Uh, this is before digital cameras arrived and we took photographs. And we, when we got the photographs back from the chemist, you had a little, lot of, uh, a little strip of negatives with them. And that's what they look like. Next one, please. That's num number six. On the, on, the, um, on the left, you can see a, uh, a photo negative image on the shroud. And on the, um, in 1898, Secundo Pia took a photograph. And on the right, you can see what he actually saw, which is a photo positive image of the image on the left. And it astounded him. I think it is an astounding image. So let's move on to the next one, uh, image number seven. Now, the great controversy is who exactly created or supposedly created this shroud. Now, uh, it's supposed to be, um, according to the carbon dating, it's supposed to be medieval. And most people seem to think that the most intelligent man around at the time was Leonardo da Vinci, who's on the left. 
Um, Leonardo da Vinci lived from 1452 to 1519, and the question is, could he have created the Shroud of Turin? He certainly was a very, very intelligent person. Highly, highly gifted scientist, artist, and a lot more besides. Uh, image number eight, he actually did have a camera obscura, uh, which is a fairly primitive camera, but one big but, what it couldn't do is image number nine, it couldn't create a three-dimensional image of the face of Jesus Christ on the shroud. We need image number nine uh, up so that we know what we're talking about. Okay. Um, I'll explain that the Shroud of Turin has encoded in it a three-dimensional uh, information and nobody knows how, they got, how it got there and nobody can do it today. So there is a three-dimensional image of the face, I believe, of Jesus Christ. Let's look at the next picture, number 10. There is a three-dimensional uh, image of the body of Jesus Christ taken from the Shroud of Turin. Now, that is why um, I don't think it is at all possible that Leonardo da Vinci or anybody else created the Shroud of Turin. In other words, I don't think it could possibly be a fraud. Let's look at the next picture, image number 11. There are the hands on the Shroud of Turin, and as you can see, they look like x-rays. Well, x-rays have only been around uh, for, for, a few, for about 100 years. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci didn't have access to x-ray uh, technology, and I can't un understand how a medieval forger could possibly do something with x-rays on it. Right, let's move on. And I want to tell you next about uh, image number 12, which is a VP8 image analyzing computer. Now, this uh, was... was uh, this was designed during the uh, space research uh, program during the late 60s and early 70s. And I want to explain to you what the VP8 image analyzing computer actually did. Uh, if you look at the next picture now, uh, image number 13, what we have there is a satellite going around the moon and taking lots and lots of photographs of the moon. Because you remember in 1969, they actually launched um, um, they launched a satellite, uh, which uh, and eventually they sent a man to the moon. Um, you remember the man walked on, uh, two men walked on the moon. Um, well, they wanted to know what the various um, volcanoes and craters in the moon were like, so they uh, sent this orbiting satellite to take lots and lots of photographs, and they sent um, that those images to. Uh, the special NASA research laboratory to those two people on that photograph you're seeing right now. And the central one is Dr. John Jackson, who is a nuclear physicist. And you can see on the left of that picture, let's look for image number 14 again. If we can look at image 14, on the left is a space research picture of um, a man in space, and on the right is the Shroud of Turin. Now, the Shroud of Turin has always been very, very controversial. So somebody had the bright idea of putting the Shroud of Turin under the VP8 image analyzing computer. And this is what they saw. They saw three-dimensional encoding, so that under the VP8 Im Im image analyzing computer, they saw a three-dimensional face, and they were absolutely stunned. I want to tell you right away, there is no other two-dimensional image on planet Earth that has three-dimensional encoding in it. Let's look at the next picture, number 16. There is, again, the three-dimensional body of Jesus. Let me tell you and reinforce once again, there is no other two-dimensional piece of cloth or image of any sort that has three-dimensional um, encoding within it. Um, for the more technical amongst you, if you take the, there are a lot of photographs taken of the Shroud in 1931, and Normally, you would expect that photograph to have about 300 megabytes of information on it. Actually, that, that particular photograph has over a, over a gigabyte of information, which means it has more than three times as much as it should have. The rest of the information is actually dimensional encoding on the shroud, and nobody knows exactly how it got there. And the purpose of this program is to explain to you how I believe that three-dimensional encoding got there. Image number 17 is an image of the linen cloth, the shroud, uh, over the body of the, uh, the person within the shroud, who I believe was Jesus. 
And I believe Jesus gave off radiation. So, for example, if that was the nose of Jesus, the radiation from the nose scorched the shroud near the nose. But if, if the lower part is the eye, which in medical terms we would call the orbit, there would be less radiation from the eye. Um, let's move on and you'll understand what I'm talking about. I want to show you now an image collimator. That is uh, something you probably won't have heard of. It's, um, it's an instrument used to focus light rays. Now, in order to um, make a shroud of Turin, what you actually need is a nuclear collimator, a nuclear collimator with three-dimensional encoding properties. And let me tell you that a nuclear collimator with three-dimensional encoding properties is not available on planet Earth. There is no such apparatus on planet Earth. It hasn't been designed yet. Nobody can do this. Nobody today, given unlimited funds, can make the Shroud of Turin or anything even remotely like it. Let's look at the next picture, uh, which is number 19, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, that was launched in 1990. They started work in 1970. It took them 20 years to design it and launch it. And that technology is available. And I believe Leonardo da Vinci was so clever that he could have created, designed, and launched the Hubble Space Telescope because the technology is available today. However, I do not believe it's possible for Leonardo da Vinci or NASA technicians or anybody on planet Earth to create a three-dimensional shroud of Turin. Let's move on now and move to the next picture, which is number 20. First thing people say is the Shroud of Turin is not in the Bible. And that's another pe reason why people say they're not interested in the Shroud of Turin. This is an image of Lazarus uh, after Jesus raised him from the dead. And you'll notice that Lazarus is wound in bandages. If we go to the, I'm not going to read out all the text because it takes too long, but in John 11, verses 43 and 44, we're told that Lazarus was wound in grave clothes. There is uh, the grave clothes, kairas. Um, the Greek is kairas, and the, basically they are bandages. So when Lazarus came out of the tomb, his body was wrapped in kairos. In fact, on, on Easter Sunday morning, the two Marys were going to go and anoint the body of Jesus with, um, with ointment and, and, and um, bury him properly with kairos or grave clothes in the same way as Lazarus. But it took about six hours. Right, let's move on now. Um... The next picture I want to show you is a sudarium. When Jesus, we're told in the, in the New Testament, when the Lazarus came out of the tomb, he had a sudarium, like a handkerchief or a napkin, over his face. Now, we know what a sudarion is because it, that word appears in the New Testament in Acts 19. We're, to, we're told in Acts 19, verse 11, that Paul handed out handkerchiefs and aprons uh, that had touched his skin, and they were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So what Paul did in Acts 19 was to use sidarium, uh, in other words, napkins made of linen and, and gave them to sick people and they were healed. So we know it was a sedarium. So the traditional Jewish um, burial is to put a, a napkin over the face and the whole body would be wound in bandages. Now, did this happen to Jesus? No, it didn't. Let's look at the next picture, image 23. Image 23 we're looking at now. Now, when Jesus was taken down from the cross, which was a very gruesome business, um, there was only three hours between three o'clock in the afternoon and the start of Passover at um, six o'clock that evening in which to bury Jesus. So they had to do something very quickly. They didn't have time to put him in the normal grave clothes. They, wound, they put him in a huge cloth. And it's, you, there, are set, there are two separate words used in the New Testament for that large piece of cloth. Um, in John 20, verse 6, 
It, it says this, Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw there the linen cloths, the Greek is orthonia, lying there, and the handkerchief, the sidarium in Greek, that had been around his head. So Peter actually saw two pieces of cloth. One was an Athonia and one was a Sidarium. We've already, know, we've already looked at Sidarium. We know what that is. That's like a napkin or an apron. That was over his face. When somebody dies, either in a hospital or a battlefield or a car accident or anything else, uh, even today you will cover the face. And that's the very first thing they did. As soon as Jesus came off the cross, they covered his face with a napkin a linen napkin. But then they cover the rest of his body with this thing in Greek called an athonia. Now, the thing, uh, when you study the New Testament, it's, it's very good to have a Greek lexicon with you so that you can find out what these words actually mean. There are two words. One is a syndon and one is an athonia. I want to use to go to the word syndon first. In Mark 15, verse 46, it says that um, um, he bought fine linen, the word is syndon, took him down and wrapped him, that Jesus, in the linen, in the linen, and the Greek word is syndon. So we want to know exactly what Jesus was buried in. Well, we know what Sindon is if we look elsewhere in the New Testament. Let's look at image number 24 now. Now, there is a picture of Mark. Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, or to whom it's attributed, uh, fleeing the Garden of Gethsemane, leaving behind him a cloak which covered his whole body. It's blue in that picture, um, called a Sindon. We're told about that in Mark 14, verse 51. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment, a syndon, was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving the garment, the syndon, behind. So Jesus was buried in something like Mark was wearing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right, let's move on to this other word, athonia. In Luke 24, it says, Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths, the athonia, lying by themselves. So we might ask, well, what does that word athonia actually mean? And we do the same. We have to look and find out where that word is used in the New Testament. Let's look at image number 25. Actually, Peter, in the... In the New Testament, had a vision which involved a great sheet coming down called an athonia. So, in image 26, Jesus was buried in a great sheet or a large piece of cloth suitable for um, covering a person such as Mark. So, the, a shroud is definitely in the New Testament. Now, this is confirmed that the shroud is an ancient piece of linen. By the next picture, image number 27, a wonderful lady called Mestil Fleury Lemberg, who is a world authority on ancient textiles. She was the former curator of the, of the Swiss Abegg Foundation Textile Museum. She has various technical things to say, but what she actually says in image number 28 is that the piece of the linen is actually a very precious piece of ancient linen woven on the same cloth as another ancient linen found in Masada, wo woven on the same loom. So we know that that is a first century linen, not only for this reason, for other ones I'm coming to. We're now going to look at a forensic examination of the shroud by image number 29, Dr. Robert Bucklin, um, who is a forensic pathologist who's gone to be with the Lord now. Um, he's actually, in his lifetime, did over 25,000 post-mortems. In America, they call them autopsies. But he, he found lots of things, and we're going to look very quickly at what, they, what he found. Um, image number 30, there is the shroud of Turin, the front and the back, and you can see, we're going to look at it a bit more closely, lots and lots of scourging marks. Um, let's look at the front more closely in image 31. What you can see there is lots of scourging marks. Remember, Jesus was scourged and all of his uh, skin was ripped off. You can see the crown of thorns with the blood tracking down, and you can see the marks in the wrists there on the shroud. Um, let's look at image number 32 now. 
uh, there was blood flowing from the scalp. Now that is clearly on the shroud, and actually on the original shroud, it's bright red with lots of um, bilirubin in it, which is given off um, by tortured uh, people. Um, and that's why it's bright red. It's bright red on the shroud. On that particular photo positive image, the blood is in photo negative. Right, next picture. Dr. Robert Bucklin noticed that the, um, the nasal cartilages had been fractured and there was lots of bruising around the face where I be believe Jesus had been um, um, bullied by 480 members, um, 480 soldiers, as, as I described in the talk on the crucifixion. Let's look at the next picture, number 34. He noticed that uh, there was a large collection of blood around the right chest wall, um, and that's where the lance was um, placed between the fifth and sixth right ribs by the soldier at, the, at Golgotha, making sure that Jesus was truly dead. Uh, let's look at the next picture now. This is image 35. There are the nails in the wrists in Death's Dot's point. Remember that um, actually the nails didn't go through the, hand, the palms of the hand, but through the wrists. Uh, and the next picture, there actually in number, image number 36 is Death's Dot's point. That is actually where the nail went in. And you can actually feel in the back of your own hand a little, a little uh, place where you can put your thumb in on the back of your um, wrist, and that's where the nail went through Jesus' uh, wrists. Um, image number 37, when Jesus hung on the cross, his, his hands became rather like claws, and his thumb was what we call pronated, in other words, flexed inwards, and that's why the, uh, on the shroud the thumbs appear to be missing. Uh, image number 38, is the nailing of the feet. And image number 38, you can see that some blood tracking down onto the shroud from the blood around the, uh, around the feet. Uh, next picture now, we're looking at the image 39, we're looking at the back of the shroud now. And what you can see there is lots of scourge marks, lots and lots of scourge marks, because remember Jesus was whipped uh, with a, basically a cat and nine tails called a, a flagrum, and his skin was ripped off, and you can see that he has scourge marks on his back and on his legs. In fact, it says in uh, Isaiah 52 that he was unrecognizable on the cross. Let's look at number, image number 40. Jesus was carrying the heavy crossbeam, and in fact, there's bruising over the back, over his shoulders on the Shroud of Turin. Um, let's um, finally, Dr. Bucklin actually concluded from all of this data, it's not unreasonable, an unreasonable conclusion for the forensic pathologist to determine that only one person in history has undergone the sequence of events as described. That person is Jesus Christ. So that's what Dr. Bucklin actually says. What you're looking at now is actually Dr. Max Fry, who's a pollen specialist a member of the STIRP team, Dr. Max Fry, and he found, he's actually a botanist, and he found lots and lots of pollen and spores on the shroud. Let's look at image 42, spores on the shroud. Um, he found in 1973, uh, 1973 and 1978, he took lots of samples from the shroud, and he found that it had lots and lots of different spores and pollen of plants found only in Jerusalem. Now the next picture is image number 43, and that's Dr. Avinoam Danin, a botany professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he was shown the Shroud of Turin. Um, I haven't got time to, to describe his detailed um, uh, discoveries. He found various spores on it. Let's look at the next picture, number 44. He found Zygophyllum dumosum, the spores of that plant. And he found uh, the spores of a next plant, which is 45 Guandelia 2040. Um, and he said that uh, this, the shroud definitely came from Jerusalem. 
That's what he says. The Shroud of Turin came from Jerusalem. So we got halfway through describing the Shroud of Turin. I hope you're interested in this. If you're interested, please write to me at info at Revelation TV. There's more information on my website, which is freechristianteaching.org. And please don't miss the next part, which is, all, which is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that image got onto the Shroud. Thank you for joining us. It's lovely to have you. God bless you. And we hope to see you again on, on To The Point very soon. Bless you. And it's so exciting. Bye now.